Hi, my name is Stephanie. Thank you for joining us today for five keys to good service design and service catalogs. A couple quick notes. This presentation is being recorded, so you will receive a link from me to access the recording as well as the slides. I hope to get this email out to you no later than Monday morning. Uh, as far as your phone lines, you are muted today for the entire event. So for questions, please use the Q&A panel. You can access this from the blue icon up on the toolbar with the question mark. So please use the Q&A panel and please send your presentations, I'm sorry, your questions to all panelists so that I can field those questions and assign them. Lastly, you will notice above the right-hand corner of the slide, you see right in that green bar, it says evergreen. Just above to the right, the double arrows, those will take you to full screen mode. You will find this helpful later in the presentation when Jeff Benedict is doing the live demo of our service catalog environment. So again, please use those double arrows to go full screen for the presentation. Now at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Don Kasson, CEO of Evergreen Systems. Don? Thank you, Stephanie. I'd like to wish everyone a happy Halloween, and thanks for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a little more fun with this, uh, with this webinar because of the day. Uh, well, tomorrow, obviously. I'm Don Casson, CEO of Evergreen, and with me is my usual partner in crime, Jeff Benedict, Father Jeff, who heads up Evergreen's innovation efforts and our ITSM best practice. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome. If you're a past attendee, thanks for coming. Our goal is to share, as always, valuable information and insights you can use in your planning and activities right now. The topic we'll explore today is five keys to good service design in service catalogs. This is our agenda. After a very little bit about Evergreen, we'll dive into the topic. And beyond that, we'll demonstrate some of those concepts we discussed today in our always evolving view of a very advanced self-service catalog and portal experience, uh, which happens to be built on ServiceNow. Then we'll open it up for questions if you all have any. So Evergreen is a U.S.-based consulting firm. We've worked with hundreds of mid-market Fortune 1000 and public sector organizations to help them improve IT service management execution. We're a full life cycle firm, or in other words, we have both process and technology in one company. Uh, we think great solutions require both. With Evergreen, you don't have to be the systems integrator. We do a lot of work in service catalogs, which I'm sure some of you know, and have gotten recognized for this in the marketplace, so much so that many think that this is all we do. That's not true. We have deep experience in innovation, innovative solutions across all of the ITSM disciplines, so I listed some of them today so you could see. And we are one of the top five U.S. ServiceNow partners and have over a decade of domain experience in every area of the portfolio. But that said, we do view all of this from a perspective of customer-centric IT service management. I laughed out loud when I found this picture. At Evergreen, we do think conventional ITSM thinking is wrong. And it's, you know, it's been done the same old way for the past decade, incident, problem change, a little bit of knowledge, and at the end, we might be running a little bit better, you know, but so what? What about the customer? Are we making a difference for them? Have we even really thought about them? But this old model is broken. We need to start with the customer wherever we are at this point in our evolution. If we do, it will change what we do. We may be surprised to find that our customer sees little value in what we're focusing on, and they value things that we may not even be thinking of. We can't know if we don't ask them. We create and use a lot of tools in our consulting work. Over the past couple of webinars, I began offering some guides we use every day, and here are two of them, Services Definition Dictionary and our Services Taxonomy Use Guide. If either of these are of any interest, I'll tell you at the end how you can get a copy. All right, let's jump in. I generally like to keep this pretty simple and high level so you get takeaway that you can use from the conversation in the webinar, but some of the slides today are not, not simple. Uh, as I dipped into our consulting toolbox for them. You know, at the same time, I'm excited about it because I think this set has very high, you know, long-term use value for you. So we'll stay high level in the conversation, but I hope you'll make use of these tools. Of course, if you want to know more about them, we certainly would not mind talking with you. I have three idle definitions today. A customer is someone who buys goods or service, a service is something of value you do for someone, and all they have to do is receive it. 
and a service design package or process or model is the cookbook you follow to build and maintain a service over its useful life. It's hard to coordinate services across IT from request to outcome. Every silo has hundreds of tools and processes and they've refined them over years to manage and deliver their specific outcomes. The work itself can be complex and substantially undocumented. And there's a lot of tribal knowledge that, that plays into getting the work done. Every silo is the same in nature, but the tools, processes, and knowledge are unique silo to silo. So a service can be very complex. By the way, if you were wondering, this is a workflow chart from Pinterest. Here's some research from the Office of Consumer Affairs of the White House on why customers leave. I, they, I, don't, they, they, I didn't see one on why voters don't vote, but at a high level, 3% move, 19% have product issues, 9% are price sensitive, and 69% leave because of poor service, over two thirds. That's, that's an astounding, astounding percentage. But, you know, we have an advantage in IT because our customers can't leave. They have to come to us. And this may be true in the short run, but not in the long. More and more, they find shadow IT alternatives. They complain to executives that we're not doing a very good job and IT budgets get cut. And then finally, you know, perhaps IT gets outsourced. Now stop and think for a minute. If your customers love you and think your services are great, are you as likely to be outsourced? No, not really. These customers in the picture are so unhappy with us, they are literally walking out into the desert to get away. But what we'll cover today, using a service design process, will look like a lot of work. Why can't we just start building services and giving them out to our customers? The most important reason not to is that the customers will be very upset. They'll hate us for it. Customer satisfaction is driven by setting and meeting expectations. If we raise the bar of expectation in that we're going to offer services and then deliver a bad experience, customers are actually more angry than if we had done nothing at all. So a service design process is like the assembly line of an auto manufacturer. It is your services assembly line. If you stop and visualize that assembly line, in your mind's eye for just a moment, you can see it from request to outcome with many providers collaborating and coordinating to deliver consistent, affordable, repeatable, manageable, high quality outcomes. Maybe IT is too complex to be able to do this. Maybe, but consider this. General Motors builds 9.9 million transmissions per year using over 400 suppliers with a Six Sigma level of quality. It's almost hard to believe. Are we more complex than that? A good service design process is very strategic. Technology fuels competitive advantage. That sounds important, so put a good assembly line under your business. Now let's look at the service design process and components. Here's a simplified view of the service design package for a service we are calling virtual meeting collaboration. We have a description that everyone can understand who can access the service, who owns and manages the service, and the more detailed functionality of the service. Then we find the underlying elements we need to make it fly, like SLAs and OLAs, cost, and supporting teams. A good consistent service design process is critical for customer satisfaction, simplicity, and quality. Here we have an IT service where we provide business analytics. We call this a service tombstone. That name has stuck and not everyone loves it, but it sort of looks like a tombstone, right? It gives you the information you need. Um, we have a brief description of the service offer right here. So if I'm the customer, I can decide if this is what I'm looking for. I can see that Don Goodliffe is the service owner if I want to contact someone, and I can see that it's rated three out of five stars for quality. I can also click on three different request items if I want to take an action. A good service design goal is to provide enough information so a customer can decide on their own if they want the service and then be able to take action. As part of the overall service design process, here are the high level steps we take to build a service to the point where it's ready to be put into service. 
we go from how it will be, how it will be presented to the customer, to what is included, to how we deliver it behind the scenes, to how we get feedback, and then to how we build it for manageability. If you've been on any of our webinars, you've probably seen this slide. A proper service design process begins with the three constituents of a service, the customer, the providers, and the managers. All have to be involved and have their needs met to create any truly viable service. The customer wants an excellent customer experience, and if not, they'll reject it. The provider wants execution effectiveness, and if we don't build in a way that that works out, then they won't support the change with the customers and the work around the system. The managers want governance and accountability. Without these, we cannot price and deliver a service consistently with high quality. So here's where a few of the slides get busy. We're going another level deeper. Without a consistently understood and applied service design process, you will build poor and consistent services, and you probably won't be very successful. This is a tool out of the toolkit you can use to share what the service design model is made up of, what are these components, and the big basket of benefits it brings to you. With it, you can get people to understand what a service is end to end, see their role in it, get the parts of it, lower resistance to change, and the most magic bullet, get people to understand why are we doing this. This tool supports the last slide, providing a consistent word picture for each service design model area. While it's a lot of words, it's a great reference chart, and it will help create consistent understanding and prevent a lot of questions. This is the best slide in the deck. This is a kind of a Rosetta Stone tool for the service design process and model. Across the top, we have the factors that must be considered in the model. Down the left-hand side, we have the component areas in the service design process needed to build a good service. And those orange arrows point the two out for you. In the middle, we have the function tool or process that ensures the points get connected. You can easily see just by looking at that how building solid reusable pieces in the middle can help you build high quality, complete, and consistent services pretty quickly. Along with the last framework slide, this tool is like a visual checklist to help us make sure we're getting all the inputs we need and we're delivering all the outputs that are required for high value. So, pulling that all together. A service can look like a pyramid. The height and width of the pyramid is driven by the number and complexity of the supporting services needed. Here's a very simplified example of the service email and the service family we call messaging and collaboration. In order to deliver the service email, we require the enabling services of network, server, storage, and account administration. Then in order to deliver a great customer experience, we have some key enhancing services like service desk, monitoring, and security. Last, on the far right, we're showing some of the feature options that the customer can have. As an example, the enabling service storage offers variable sizes, two gigabytes, 10 gigabytes, et cetera. So now we're gonna go and highlight the five keys to good service design. These aren't all the keys there are. I could easily come up with 10 that matter for this conversation, but that is too much for a webinar. So don't think of these as exclusive. Think of these as five that are pretty good. Our first key is clear service ownership. And this is, this is the most important and easiest thing to achieve. Here's a service we looked at before. John Goodliffe is the service owner. And this is a simple point, right? but it can cause a big change in IT. You see Don's name published right next to the customer quality rating, that's not an accident. Do you think Don will be thinking about end-to-end -end services and happy customers? You bet he will. And at the bottom, you see an evergreen design principle. If everyone owns the service, no one does.
Our second key is about user experience. That user experience matters. And this is a this is a fun one. If it isn't a success for the customer, it isn't a success. So here are bad and good examples of service catalogs or menus, right? The one on the left is too detailed, has no consistency across the options, has no natural flow, and leaves you wondering how you would build and price your choice. It's also in pounds. The menu on the right is from the famous in and out burger chain. This, is, this was in use for 50 years. It starts you on the upper left-hand side where we're all trained to start, then it flows down how we're trained to proceed. It puts a meal together how you think, burger first, then fries, then a shake. Don't want a shake? All right. A, <clears throat> a modified column two, a little bit further over, with a box to help you see it quickly, gives sweet drink options. Then coffee or milk, and you're done. Pretty fast. So do you see the five design principles at work in this service offering? This is one that comes up a lot. Since it takes time and money to build good services, for our third key, we want to make sure it's worth it. We must weigh value versus cost and risk. On the value side, here's what we're looking at. Is it worthwhile? Does it have a high intrinsic strategic or business value? Is it high volume? If we only do something three or four times a year, it may not be worth the effort to build the service. Is it highly repetitive? If we do it a lot, that's a great thing, but if every time it's very different and we can't change that, then it might not be a very good candidate. Is it simple and doesn't change a great deal over a period of time? If so, it's easier to build a self-service solution in that case and it will be viable for a nice length of time, right? So it's durable. And the last here, is it 80-20? What are the three to five things that are or could be the same? Happy meals in any area that meet 80% of the needs. This is what we're after. On the cost and risk side, what's the cost to build and run the service? How complex is it? Because that has a factor definitely on risk. And what is the risk of failure? And, you know, in this case, failure could be a poor quality service, not very good, or it could be a service that costs three times what we estimated to build it. Our fourth key is building modular services and managing them as configuration items. And this is, I've used this key before, and it's really a foundational piece. You step off right this way and life is a lot easier. It's important to apply a building block mentality to building services and then combine the blocks to create new services and variations of existing ones. If all your services are single threaded and custom built, they'll be very expensive to create, impossible to maintain and confusing to your customer. In this case, you can, you can think about Amazon. What would it be like if every Amazon department had its own checkout procedure? As customers, you wouldn't like it very much. But even that idea has challenges too. So let's say we have a checkout procedure we call a financial approval process. Well, it could be used in hundreds of services. Every service could call it that has any kind of cost issue. So service configuration management is mandatory with each service being managed as a CI and then mapped into any combined services of which it is a part. If we have to make changes to that financial process, we wanna know what's being affected by it. So I saved a really good one for last. This is a question, I know this slide looks a little bit funky, all right, but I'll walk you through it and I think it'll make sense. This is a question we get asked a lot. Should we build lots of simple services or a few big but complex services? Too many services can be confusing for the customer. Too big of a service can be a real load on IT to manage and measure. So let's start up here, right up here in the upper left-hand side, George Miller, was a researcher during World War II with a PhD from Harvard. That was when it was easier to get them. In 1956, he published a theorem called Miller's Number. It states that humans can only handle five things error-free. By the time they get to nine, there's a lot of errors. Error-free operation is highly unlikely. So the sweet spot for acceptable error rate is in that seven range, plus or minus two, and that's called Miller's Number. 
That's how many things we can, we can manage to look at and not make big mistakes. With that in mind, we know from what our customer, actually with that in mind, we have a better idea of what our customer can handle. Evergreen's numbers, that's the lower part of the screen, deal with the flow from the service taxonomy to the service, right? So we're going from the very beginning to the, from the, from the you know, uh, high level to very granular, okay? And the number of choices at each step. And that's the bottom number. So the high level, the number of steps is the four plus or minus two and the number of choices is the bottom number. So our experience has led us to believe, and it's not scientific, that the number of levels, right, that we can go through, like I said, ought to be in this four plus or minus two range. For the number of choices, we have found that Miller's number has proven to be good. Somewhere, you know, in that range of seven plus or minus two. Now these are relative statements, right? They'll, they're bell curve kinds of things. Your circumstances could be different. I think the right feel on the number of items in each step or in each category area is really on the low side of five to seven rather than on the high side of seven to nine. Also, my belief, again, from experience, is that the last category can move towards the higher side. And as you have reached really a, the specific area where the customer expects to find their answer, so their attention is a bit higher in that choice. That's, again, that's just my opinion. It's not scientific, just based on our experience. But if, I mean, I think you can use this slide in effect as a guiding tool. So our capstone key, user service design process, that's it for our presentation. I'll now turn it over to Jeff for a brief, a brief demonstration. Thank you. Okay, great. As I'm passing control over to Jeff, just a reminder for those of you uh, who may have joined late, if you use the double arrows, located just above the right top-hand corner of the presentation window. That will bring you to full screen mode, and this will be helpful as Jeff starts to dig into his demo. Also, this is being recorded, so you all will receive a link from me for the recording and the slides. And lastly, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. You can access this from the WebEx toolbar. Look for the question mark in the blue square, the Q&A panel, and please send your questions to all panelists so that I can field them. Okay, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Don. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with our uh, self-service portal. Um, as we kind of started at the beginning of the show, um, this is built on ServiceNow, and it's built specifically on the content management system of ServiceNow. Um, in this portal, you know, this is where we consume services, where we submit service requests, obviously track the status of those requests. Um, another thing I want to highlight, too, is this also is an area where we can, um, you know, broadcast alerts, make announcements, or, or push other prescriptive content to our consumers. One of the, uh, you know, use cases built into this portal is, um, you know, the delivery of that service information to our consumers, what the offerings are, what the commitments are, service health. Um, so we're starting to see here in this page kind of an organization of our services from a taxonomy perspective. Um, I can also browse through these, kind of an A to Z kind of list. Um, but also notice I can filter these <clears throat> by different organization catalogs, so my shared services catalogs. And um, then I've also got different perspectives as well. So I can kind of go information services, for example, and also then filter these by, um, say, like those services where I'm a specific subscriber. Drill into one of these services. <clears throat> so this is, as Don indicated, the, the service tombstone or brochure of kind of what the service is. Um, and, and this one specifically is uh, expense management, which is powered by some some software called Concur. And some of the information that we see here, right? We see what's in scope, what's out of scope. Um, we see kind of those offerings, those commitments. Uh, some of these are in terms of of resolution rates, availability rates. Um, we have an area where we can see the health of this particular service. And, you know, obviously the, um, the service quality is important, and that's going to be a factor of, you know, how well it's delivered to those commitments, but also the perceptions of our consumers. So this feedback tab really becomes a vehicle where we can, you know, see ratings, see quality feedback from users of that particular service. The other thing I want to highlight on this page is you'll see um, kind of where this service starts to intersect with other applications of ServiceNow, specifically the knowledge base. 
um, and the kind of request form. So we have an area where we can show frequently asked questions that are contextually relevant to this service, as well as those things you can request uh, that are related to this particular service, such as becoming a new subscriber to, um, to our software Concur. Last one other thing I want to hit on here too is, um, you know, oftentimes when we come to the, or users come to the portal, they might be looking for help because something's not working as they expect. Uh, one of the first things that is available here in the header is any notices, alerts, outages uh, can be communicated to the user in this alerts and notifications section. Um, you also see a tile here that's kind of highlighting in red that we do have actual service outages and alerts. If I click into this, um, I see more details behind kind of the health. Um, so I can see both a couple of our services, one's in an outed state, another one's in a degradation state. I can also see kind of some upcoming plan maintenance activities pertaining to some services that I, I utilize and, uh, and use. And lastly, I see an area of kind of detail in that same taxonomy of here's my different services and, and, and their health over the last five days, which, you know, can help me better understand if something wasn't working right on Wednesday, I can see well, maybe that's because that's when this particular issue started um, in regards to, say, Workday. All right, so I'm going to transition kind of away from the consumer perspective um, and let's start looking at how do we create these services and, and some of the pieces that are in this portal. Um, kind of where I want to start is on that taxonomy. Um, so I'm going to go and create a new kind of new category in our taxonomy. So here's where our different catalogs are. I want to add to our IT services catalog, and specifically I want to add a new category under business applications. I've drilled into that, and I'm going to add a new category. And I'm just going to call this, um, I'm going to call this instructional services. I'm going to give it a little icon just so it looks a little differently than that of the other service categories we have. We'll save that. That's my category. So now if I go back to our service catalog, for example, under our business applications, we now see our instructional services um, in our list with our little graduation cap as an icon. All right, so now let's go add a, a service to that particular category. So I'm going to go to business services. And I'm going to create new. I'm going to call my service uh, learning management system. And I'll fill in some details here. I'll put myself as the owner. Say our version is one. I've got a, a specific support group that supports this particular service. Um, I'm going to say our <clears throat> kind of chargeback or, or, or cost allocation is a monthly allocation. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to copy and paste some descriptive information in here just so we can kind of fill this guy out really quickly. You don't have to watch me type. I know you don't really want to watch me type. Let me just uh, copy and paste that. That's a little few. And you notice on here, so I've got a user description. I've got some at a glance. I can also fill out some details related to here's some of the features, the benefits of this service. Um, I am going to add a, a link here to our where users go to access the software behind this particular service. The other thing I'm going to do too is we're actually using a particular software product here called Litmos for our um, learning management system. So I'm going to put that in the alias so people can find it via that name or the other name. And just to kind of make it a little prettier, I'll add a picture here. Or I'll just use our product, software product picture as our picture. And then that last thing I'm going to do here is I do need to use it and then assign it to my taxonomy. So I've got a classification field, and here's where I can drill into my business applications and my instructional services category just added. And then I think I've got everything I need for my service to be filled out. So the next thing I want to do is, so on my service, I've defined kind of what do you, you know, kind of what it is, but I also want to define kind of my commitments um, in some of those those various, uh, you know, promises I'm going to make in regard to my service. And I do that at an offering level. And I'll mention here, in this case, I just have one standard offering. But if I had different commitments for different sets of users, you know, you can think of this as gold versus silver versus platinum, then I would have different offering records for each of those different um, kind of combinations. In this case, I'm going to keep the price at zero because I'm, this is, in my mind, this is free to our consumers. But I'm going to set some commitments out here just to measure and manage against this particular service. So 
So I'm going to first of all set a kind of incident resolution rate. I'll just say that's in eight hours. I'm going to set a availability target, and then I'll also set a service request delivery target of one business day. So this becomes kind of the you know the agreements that we have, or what users can expect um, uh, in, in some of the measures, the things we're going to actually measure in regard to this particular service, and, and you know and promise to deliver it as part of this. And one of the things that's happening kind of right now, and why it's going to take in a second or two, is it actually is going out and looking at kind of historical transactions to see kind of, uh, kind of what the actual delivery is of these particular commitments against this particular service. The last thing I want to do just to kind of complete the picture of this particular service tombstone record is I want to link it to some of our other services. Don mentioned um, <clears throat> kind of building services as components or building blocks. And so one of the things that we can do is so, for example, in this particular case, maybe this service is dependent on, um, say, our identity management service for authentication. So I can go and build a relationship or a dependency between this service and that of identity management. And now I've got this relationship tree, which I can show in more of a map view, which now shows here's our learning management system and its dependency on the identity management system, which has a number of components that are also make up that service and are de and dependent on um, and are needed to be healthy in order for this particular service to be effective and, and be usable. So now we've got our service definition. The, lot, you know, the next area I want to go is I want to make some things requestable in context to my service. So I'm going to go create a couple of catalog items in service now. And rather than kind of start with a blank slate, I'm going to actually um, borrow from some of our existing request items that we have out here and just kind of tweak these to match our new uh, our new kind of uh, components. So I'm going to have a request access element. So we're going to request access to our software. I'll just kind of duplicate the description here. And let me copy some other text down here real quick just to have this thing look a little more complete. There's some description. I'm going to order this. And we will insert and stay as a way to copy that existing item. I will give it a picture, which we'll call this one access. So there's one item to request access to our software. Uh, I'm also going to create one for uh, a role change. So let's just take this exact same one and we'll just change its description to have another one for one to request access to the software and one now to uh, request a change to your role or your rights within that particular software. I'm going to order that one just a little differently, copy the same detail, blank this out, and then I'll insert and stay. And then just to complete this guy, I'll give it a different picture for role change. All right, so there's two items that I have now that I can request in context this particular software. And uh, before I go any further, let me point out, I'm going to pull up one slide just to highlight um, something we use in a lot of our, our implementations. And, and that is we have built uh, kind of a way to accelerate the process of getting these kind of service automation stood up. Um, we call this kind of our global or standard global workflow. And really what it is is we, we use tables and definitions to have kind of one standard workflow, but then use tables to define what are the tasks, what are the approvals, what's the sequencing, and, and this works really well for kind of a large quantity of services where they, that kind of fit into a, you know, category of low or, or medium complexity where, you know, they can be delivered with a, a set of, you know, sequenced tasks or authorizations and don't require, you know, heavy scripting or integrations. Um, and this also provides a framework where, as a service owner, we could actually go, you know, enable them as a citizen developer to go out and define their own processes, kind of using a simple form to set the, the tasks, the approvals, the activities of that given workflow. So kind of with that as a primer, let me um, kind of show you that. We'll use this particular item as our example. And what we have here is a link to say use global workflow. So when I click this, basically taking me to my kind of blank canvas page where I can define kind of the workflow. And the first thing I want to do here is I want to set up my different sequences. So these are going to be, in essence, the phases of my workflow. 
I'm just going to start with three to kind of show you as an example here. In my first sequence, I want to add a prompt or I want to add kind of get a approval for uh, the manager of the requester. So I'm going to say get manager approval. I'm going to generate, just click generate a, uh, approval. I'm going to choose from my list of predefined people who can approve this and say I'm going to have the customer manager approve this particular request. That's my first kind of step. Maybe my second step is maybe I want to also prompt for the customer to approve this. So I can do kind of the same thing. Right? Instead of choosing customer manager, I'll choose uh, kind of customer instead. I'll add that into the mix. In my second sequence, let me add a kind of fulfillment task for our group to um, kind of configure our new roles. I'm going to say generate a task. And from here, I'm going to use a template to pre-fill the details of that particular task um, for, for configuring those application roles. And then the last step in here, I really want to get the customer to confirm <clears throat> that, that our setup is, is, you know, matches their expectations. I'm going to use a get customer verification activity here. I'm going to add that to my, my palette. So now I've got a flow here that has two different approvals that happen in the first sequence a task to be completed, and then a confirmation from the customer that all, all is working as they expect. Now, the only thing I don't love about this flow is I've got both my approvals happening at the same time. Really, what I, I really want is my customer approval to happen after my manager approval. So to fix that, I'm going to add another lane in here. I'm just going to kind of move some things over. So I'll move that guy over here, move that guy over here. I'll move my customer approval to the fourth section here. All right, so now I've got my flow kind of set up for Two different two stages of approval, configure roles, and then a task to confirm these things. All right, so now, now that I've got my workflow set up, let's see these things kind of as a culmination or as, a, as, it, all, as it all kind of put together. So I'm logged in as somebody else, um, a lady named Alex, uh, Alex, Alice Smith. So what Alice can do, let's say she wants to go look for something related to learning management, she does a search. And we'll just kind of whittle my results down. So we found our learning management system service that we just created. So here's those details of that service, right? We can kind of see as we scroll down here, uh, the offerings we set up. We also have those request items that we linked, uh, that we set up that are related to this particular software product behind this service. So there's kind of a built-in relationship here. And so Alice can go, let's first of all, request access. I'll come out here and request access to this software. And maybe she needs this for, uh, needs to learn say, Java from our learning management system. So we'll request this. And the workflow of this particular access request is really, is kind of an interesting one in that we have set this up so that any of these access related requests basically have no humans involved in them. Just to show you the details of this, they have a, um, we remember if we, set, we established our linked identity management, so that's where this activity came into play to provision a new account for our identity management system for Alice to this particular software. Um, and then it went through after that create account activity and went out and added some additional rights to Active Directory, is validating the access, and then delivering that information to the user. So it's all kind of, should all be done now. As I come back to here, this page should refresh. As it is, it shows it's now completed. I can see all my details of this, this request. So now Alice is basically set up with an account, right? So the, the next one, so let's just say, you know, Alice goes out and checks her access to this software and it doesn't meet her needs entirely and she needs some additional rights. She can come back to our learning management system kind of tombstone and request kind of a role change as well, right? So in here, I can order this guy. Maybe my reason is, is you know, not seeing Java courses I need. All right, so she'll order this guy. And now I'm dropped into my status page where I can walk, where I can review the progress of this particular request. I'm gonna go to view details just to show you some of the details here. And I can kind of see some of that same workflow activity here. I can see how is it being fulfilled, how is it uh, being accomplished. 
I now want to kind of just show you where that global workflow comes into play on this item. I'll go into kind of just as, the, as a fulfiller <clears throat> and what this item looks like, and we'll go through kind of the steps real quickly. Here's the role change. All right, so the first step in our, in our sequence that we set up, if you remember, was to request uh, the requester's a manager to approve this request. That's kind of where it is first. So Carla is the manager of, of, uh, of Alice, so it's asking for Carla's approval. So I'm going to approve as Carla. And then the next step after our kind of manager approval was the actual customer to approve it as well. And I have to refresh while the workflow is kind of uh, moving in the background. So as I reload, I'll now see now Alice, who is our requester, is now asking her to approve it. So since I'm logged in as Alice, I'm going to go ahead and just approve it out in, in her view versus on her behalf. But she can come out here, right, to her approvals. She's request uh, for access. Let me approve that myself since it's for me. And then our next step in this process should be refresh again. Should be a task to our fulfillment group, which I now see down here. And this is where that uh, task template came into play to fill in the details of this particular request. And so let's, you know, so we adjust the roles and rights, and then this group basically closes out this particular task. And then the last step, last step of that process was the customer confirmation. So let me come back over as Alice, and we'll see if it's waiting for her to confirm uh, confirmation. And it is. So she comes to her page. She can see, oh, this item is basically near complete, but it's asking for her to confirm that everything is indeed set up to her satisfaction. I could say no and kind of reroute this back to the fulfillment group. Or in this case, I can say yes, request is complete. And then it goes to a completed closed state. And that's all built from that uh, kind of global workflow. The uh, kind of last area I want to go into is you remember I set myself up as the owner of our new learning management system software um, or service. <clears throat> and so there is an area for me as the service owner out here as well. Where I can go to not my services, but I can go to services I own, and I'll see is my learning management system service. In this page, what I can see here is I can see any of my requests that are submitted. Right, so I see those two that Alice submitted already. Obviously, this is a pretty early uh, process of my service. I see my commitments and how well we've performed against those. Um, if I had any other service feedback or quality, I'd see those on this page as well. Um, I see my relationships to uh, my different components and subservices. And I can also, just to kind of complete my dashboard, I can add some reports out here. Maybe I want to see from our templates some of the, um, you know, incidents of my service or incidents related to my service or requests related to my service. So I can plot those out here and kind of see some, some graphics and charts uh, related to my overall service. And I also see here a new subscriber. I get announcements that are related to my particular service. So that uh, I kind of went, you know, round and I went, you know, a couple different number of different steps here. But hopefully this was, uh, you know, helpful for you to kind of see both the customer side of it, but also the different uh, authoring of, of the components of the service, the offerings, and and the different requestable pieces in workflow that go into defining these service catalog uh, components. So I thank you. All right, thanks, Jeff. So, you know, I'd like to make a point that uh, that sort of just came up in your last statement there. The, you know, one of the things that we think makes us fairly unique in how we're approaching this is from the beginning, we've thought about all three constituents. We've got customers, we've got providers, and we've got managers. And we've got to meet all three of them. And typically, you know, we find that a lot of organizations or even companies in the, in the ecosystem think about the customer side or the interface of it but they may give short shrift to the, the provider or to the manager. And we put a lot of time and energy into all three of those perspectives, you know. And in, in, in effect, you know, if you can't manage it, it's not durable and reliable. And, you know, if you can't help the providers, and we already talked about this a little bit, but it kind of stands out. And so when you look at what we've done, there's multiple sides of a coin we're trying to pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> so possible next steps. Uh, if you found this at all interesting and you wonder what might be a next step, 
you know, here are a couple of options, uh, and I have updated these recently. The uh, our self service catalog and portal, which Jeff was demonstrating, is uh, actually it's the most viewed app on the ServiceNow App Store, which is pretty cool. Out of 122 apps, it is available as a self service demo on our website. You can just follow the link. It, it's fun to play with, and there are over 500 people demoing it now, which is also pretty cool. You can uh, follow the front page banner, and you're using it in a few minutes. Or perhaps you know you're considering a broader service catalog initiative, or a way you want to change that, but you're not sure where to start. Uh, we most of our customers do end up starting with a one-day private service catalog workshop, and we found that's really good. It educates the team, kind of gets a common language in place and a direction. And you know the the feedback we've gotten is it saves a lot of time. It can save months in consensus building and get a program moving faster. So that's a uh, that's you know, a great way to get moving. Uh, last, if you want a copy of the Service Definitions Dictionary or the Service Taxonomy Guide, just reply via email and we'll be in touch to get it to you. So that's all we've got to cover today and we'll open it up for any questions we have uh, in the meantime, Steph. So uh, first of all, as far as those requests, you can email me at marketing at ever, Excuse me, Evergreen SIS, that's S Y S, so marketing at Evergreen SIS with those requests, and I will have uh, the appropriate person follow up with you. Uh, as far as questions, um, Don, I think this first one's probably for you. It says, is part of your business to come into an organization, interview each IT department, and build a service catalog for each department? Okay. Um. I guess the answer is yes, and, and that is a big part of what we do, but actually this question is a, it gives an, an opportunity to make an important distinction. It's you don't want a lot of service catalogs because then, you, then what happens is you lose governance and you lose consistency and you lose your overall look and feel that, that applies across everything you're doing. So even though it sounds like a minor distinction, you have subservice catalogs or, or areas where services are provided that then feed up into the overall service catalog. But that, you know, looking at it that way with subservice catalogs makes you focus on the fact that there's one service catalog and so you have one consistent approach to your customer. Because the customer doesn't understand if everything looks different every place they go, right? So it's kind of a, it's an important distinction, but the answer is yes. Uh, that's really what does happen, and if you look on our website and look at the service taxonomy, that's a way to actually organize those services and those kind of sub-service catalog areas that then roll up into a logical overall approach. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, Don, I, I just got this question, this is for you for sure. Uh, I have already requested the two guides you mentioned. Do you have any plans to bring any additional documents or tools out for webinar attendees? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're caught up to me right now. So uh, by the next webinar, we will have a, uh, a fresh piece of, of IP that you guys can access if you want to. And uh, you know, it's, uh, I realize that you know, after a while, everybody's seen it. So yeah, we're working on that. Okay, great. Um, Joe, uh, Joe, I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, I believe this one's for you. It says, I like the idea of a fully automated request, such as the access request. Are there other services you see be, being automated without fulfillment tasks? Uh, certainly, yeah. I mean, I think any, any request that, uh, you know, I guess I, I would look at any opportunity to try to have fully automated requests, obviously from a customer perspective. Uh, those are nice. Um, I will say a couple examples, you know, and maybe these are, are mixed, maybe they're not fully automated, but may have pieces and parts of them that are automated where you don't have human-based tasks. But, the, you know, some of the things we see onboarding, offboarding, kind of uh, employee events, role changes are, are certainly common. Um, and, you know, and certainly when it comes to things like onboarding, th those are areas where, you know, we set oftentimes set a bad impression, um, you know, as service providers out of the gate with new employees. So certainly you want to you know, kind of have that as a, a splash when a new employee starts. Um, other areas, uh, obviously I covered access um, in, in the demo. Password management is another area that we see a lot of people automate. Um, also computing, like through EC2, Amazon Azure, VMware, SkyTap, those are also very common. Um, I'd say in, in general, we obviously want to look at where we can save the most uh, you know, business benefit. 
and uh, and oftentimes that is an area where you know you can we can get some saving if we reduce some of the human time spent on the fulfillment activities. Great, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, another question for you: What parts of this demo are customizations from Evergreen versus built-in tools? You know, yeah. In general, I would say you know, we are obviously using what to what the power of the ServiceNow platform were possible. Um, obviously, you saw some of the workflow uh, in the demo today. That that is you know native power that we've we've created our own kind of workflows to demonstrate some of the activities today. Um, the things that are really evergreen, unique, uh, you know, as, as we indicated in the previous slide here, we do have an application that we have in the application store for our self-service portal. That is, um, you know, code we've added into the content management system of ServiceNow. Um, another thing I did show today, that global uh, kind of standard workflow and kind of the interface for setting out those different uh, sequences and steps and tasks is, is not something you'll find um, out of the box with ServiceNow. Yeah, we've um, it is all built in the ServiceNow platform. Though there's no other code outside that, right? So it's con it's completely part of what you have if you have ServiceNow or might have. Uh, but we, you know, we've been working on it. We've been developing this for almost two years now, which just seems like a long time. And you know, we're close to 3,000 lines of code actually in the solution. So it's pretty deep and broad and wide. But it is all built in ServiceNow. Uh, one quick note, I'm receiving questions again about the recording. Yes, you will receive a link uh, to access this recording and the slides, and I will have it out to you no later than Monday afternoon and possibly this afternoon if WebEx uh, cooperates with the recording. Um, another question for you, Jeff. What relationships or dependencies do you support between services? Uh, I mean, certainly, I see from a ServiceNow technology perspective, it's it's relatively endless um, in terms of, you know, as you saw, I, I created a relationship in the demo between our learning management system and identity management. You could create any number of relationships through that map. Um, I will say, typically, the service-to-service -service relationships tend to be a depend-on, um, which can be used for a couple different activities. Uh, you kind of highlighted a little today. You know, the, the primary one tends to be a you know, showing um, a, a dependency from either a health or, or uh, you know, I guess usage perspective. So if you're, you know, that comes into play for like creating a change and planning a change to show what impact would a change to one service or component of a service have to other services that depend on it. Um, and, and same when you have an outage or, or an incident and what are the upstream downstream impacts uh, from services that relate. The other thing that you know that I showed today, you can use those relationships for is, is in your actual fulfillment workflows. Um, you could check to see if you know in this case if a service is related to another service like an any management and, and call some of the component activities of those dependent or related services. Yeah, and that's a uh, let me add on to that because that's a really good question. The you can't discover a service to service relationship with discovery technologies, right? I mean, you can discover that that applications are exchanging information, but you don't necessarily know what it is. So you can say, that's a real problem. How do we know? Or how will we know? Uh, but the answer is pretty simple. If every service that we have is a configuration item, right, and we're managing through configuration, then as a process, anyone who wants to consume the service requests it, and we know they're there. And in the same light, if we want to consume a service that powers our service, we're doing that same thing. So because of the interaction, with configuration management and the request process for service access, you know at all times exactly what your service to service mapping is. It's always correct, which is pretty cool. Great. Uh, Don, a question for you. It says, I got a little confused in, in the discussion regarding the service design model versus the service design process. Could you clarify? Mm, yeah, I can see that. Um, okay. so. And I probably should have made this more clear. The, the service design model is the highest order item. You know, that's the big Megilla. And the service design process is a functional part of that. It's a component or it's a part of this, the total service design model, right? So uh, the, big, the big parent is the model. Great. Uh, reminder, we do have a few minutes left. So if you have some more questions, feel free to send them in using the Q&A panel. And in the meantime, Jeff, I've got another one for you. 
uh, will the portal presentation of services and taxonomy work for me if I already have defined services and category, categories in ServiceNow? Uh, yeah, I mean, the short answer is certainly yes. Um, you know, we really didn't overhaul the structure of how services and categories are specified in ServiceNow, but rather, you know, kind of added a layer of presentation with our CMS portal, um, kind of interact with those services and those related components. Um, so, you know, the chances are, you know, if we were to work with a customer or work with the customer that has an existing set of services and categories in ServiceNow, I mean, one of our first steps would be to kind of review those um, from a taxonomy, service design, and kind of, you know, how you're managing those services in ServiceNow to make sure they kind of cover or align with some of the principles that we've kind of outlined today in our webinar. Um, you know, we might obviously from there make some suggestions on restructuring or augmenting those service definitions so they, you know, best serve the needs of customers. Okay, great. And um, I only see one more question, and Jeff, uh, for you, would it be possible to use the portal for the listing of services and fulfill the request in another system? Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly, um, you know, we have some customers that are approaching this where uh, they really want to provide kind of a new front door to their customers, but aren't really ready to display some of their, you know, existing tools they use for fulfillment of requests. Um, you know, and to do this really appropriately and correctly, an integration between ServiceNow and the other system would need to be kind of bi-directional, so you could both uh, provide status updates via the portal on the fulfillment activities, as well as, you know, as you saw today, allow the, the customer to interact with the request, you know, kind of those confirmations, those feedbacks, those approvals. Um, but that is something that we, uh, we see and, and do with some of our customers. Yeah, and it's not uncommon, actually, especially the larger the legacy footprint is. If someone's got a large BMC footprint or a large HP service management footprint, you know, it's, it's quite a task to move that. And it might not be funded. It might not be, you know, it might not be something that there's bandwidth to do in a given time frame, and yet the customer experience, you know, is falling pretty far behind, you know, what the, what the marketplace begins to accept. So this is that more and more we see this happening to organizations and it gives them a way, as far as the customer's concerned, the interaction dramatically changes. Jeff, I did receive another question for you. Uh, do you have a integration reference model? What generic building blocks do you integrate with? Uh, you know, I mean, certainly we have, uh, you know, done a number of integrations in the past. There tends to be kind of a common approach in terms of how we design and outline the integrations. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, but part of it is, 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 is kind of aligning in the workflow and the process flow where the integration points need to establish. And then there is some technical design templates and tools that we use in terms of how do we, you know, both what's the mechanism for integration and what's the, the mapping between those particular, um, you know, systems. Uh, to, to tie those things together. Um, you know, by default, we tend to do most of our integrations these days, REST or, or SOAP-based web services. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's basically, I mean, uh, kind of we, we tend, yeah. to, tend to leverage some of those common mechanisms. Integration has gotten a lot simpler, you know, over the last five years. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a requirement now of any, anybody who creates software these days that they have to create some, you know, they're going to create an API with their software, right? Um, and it tends to be pretty, use, leverage a lot of standard uh, or common standards, whether, you know, in terms of authorizations as well as um, kind of a, a common REST-based APIs and so forth. Okay, great. Well, I think that's the last of our questions. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending. You will receive an email from me with the recording and the slides. And if you have any follow-up questions or would like to request the documents, please email me at marketing at evergreensys.com. Thank you.